After spending 16 months in early access, Mechabellum 1.0 has just been released. It's been a strong start, with the game attracting thousands of concurrent players on Steam and generating a very positive fan reaction. Although described as a tactical war game, I think most of us are more familiar with the term Auto Battler. You may be familiar with other Auto Battlers, such as the hugely popular Teamfight Tactics, a spin off from League of Legends. RTS, and particularly StarCraft fans, will be thinking of the legendary custom map Desert Strike, or its spin off variants such as Direct Strike and Nexus Wars. If you take your typical RTS game and you do away with all unit micro, and to some extent you take away the macro economy side of the game, then what you're left with is the core auto battler gameplay mechanic. Each player is given a large grid area in which they can place down units and sometimes also defensive structures. This building or planning phase is then followed by a combat phase where the units and structures which you've placed come to life and automatically do battle for you against the ones which have been placed by your opponent. In combat, units tend to gain experience and they can be leveled up and sometimes they can also be equipped with items. So the gameplay basically boils down to selecting the right mix of units to counter and defeat your opponent's mix. Also selecting a winning formation for those units because where they're placed can have a huge bearing on the outcome of battles. Then you may also have decisions such as whether to spend money on upgrading certain units and making them stronger or investing in just having more units. What tends to then happen is there'll be repeating rounds of these preparation and then combat phases and after each battle the winning team will have some number of surviving units which will carry on and crash into the enemy player and do damage to their health bar which when reduced to zero will signal the end of the entire match. So if there's a very one-sided battle with many surviving units then the damage can be quite severe and if these continue the game can be over fairly quickly. When you consider there are typically over 30 distinct types of units in these games and they can be deployed in very large playing areas in wide ranges of formations and then you consider the items, the upgrades, the various perks and skill trees as well it should quickly become apparent that these types of games particularly on the PC are much more than just rock paper scissors there's huge replayability and depth here Now while the genre does have some detractors who focus on the mobile auto battlers which are very simplistic and microtransaction heavy, Mecha Bellum is a very different beast. It's an ambitious, large-scale PC auto battler which is not pursuing that mobile-style monetization model. It's clear that Mecha Bellum has enjoyed a very productive early access phase. The game is just jammed full of quality features. Although primarily a PvP multiplayer game, a lot of solo content was added during development. Initially, you're greeted with a fairly comprehensive tutorial system. This takes players through some basic gameplay mechanics, such as the various units and their respective counter units, in addition to creating formations to give yourself the best chance of victory. It then takes players through some more advanced concepts, such as upgrading units and training them with new skills. It also looks at battleground abilities, which allow you to do things such as launch missiles or create oil spills on the ground. Before venturing into the world of player versus player, you can practice against the in-game AI. You can either play normal matches or you can try survival mode, where you attempt to repel wave after wave of incoming enemies. If you just want to play around with some unit combinations or look at the game mechanics in more detail, you can also try the testing grounds. It's essentially a sandbox where you can deploy units and see what happens. Finally, we have the community challenges. These represent hand-picked rounds from the weekly tournaments where it puts you in the perspective of one of the players and you have to try and win the upcoming battle. These challenges range from beginner-friendly scenarios to extreme challenges where fewer than 1% of all players who have attempted them have managed to succeed. The reason something like this is possible is thanks to the game's extremely powerful replay and spectator system, which I'll expand upon a bit later. Once you venture into the world of multiplayer, you can see that we're currently within a season and there are various rewards which can be unlocked during it. You have a very powerful browsing tool for looking at open games and lobbies. So you can either spectate ongoing games or you can potentially join a lobby which is looking for players. You can filter this based on your preferred game types. You can also sort it based on the ladder ranking of the participants or perhaps based on the number of spectators or how many people have placed a bet on the outcome of the match. I really like this view. I think it does a great job of creating a sense of connected experience as a community. You're not just here alone, you're sharing this experience with others and you can spectate games together, meet new friends in lobbies, or discuss the outcome of potential matches and place bets. 
Now of course browsing through lobbies is probably not the most effective way of finding your own matches and the game does have a very comprehensive matchmaking and ELO system. So when you're ready, you can select your preferred game type from 1 versus 1, 2 versus 2, and you've got a few choices within that, or the four player free for all brawl. The first thing that happens within each game mode is that you play 10 matchmaking games, which the client uses to ascertain your skill level. Each of these game modes has a separate ranking ladder and you will have an ELO rating for each. It's worth noting that you can queue multiple game modes at once and the game will serve you with the one which pops first in the queue. Once you load into your first battle, you're greeted with a few multiple choice perks to choose. These will carry with you through the entire game. And while they do make a difference, they're not game-breakingly important. So for example, you could take a perk which makes your air unit stronger and then build entirely ground-based units and still win. After each subsequent round of preparation and combat, you will have another more minor perk to choose from. This could range from something such as selecting a free unit or perhaps an item to equip on one of your units. You could also take another passive bonus or perhaps an active bonus such as the ability to call down a missile strike every third turn. Now, while these perks do add a lot of flavour to the game and allow you to really express your playstyle, crucially they are not game-breakingly important. If you take TFT for example, that's a game where it often feels like gambling, and if you don't get the, the specific perk that you need for your unit composition, then you're just dead in the water. Here that's not the case. So during each preparation round, you receive an amount of credits to spend, and these increase with each subsequent round, so things ramp up to larger and larger army sizes. These can be spent on buying new units to deploy, upgrading existing units which have gained experience, or perhaps buying army-wide upgrades, such as an attack bonus to all of your units. You can also spend credits on single-use temporary items, which can give you a boost in the upcoming battle. These could be things such as missile launchers, or defences against enemy projectiles, shield devices, or temporary range upgrades for your army. And obviously there's a trade-off there, because you're spending money for a temporary boost, but you're not really adding to your army size for subsequent battles. In addition to the standard rectangular grid area where you can place your units, after round 2, you can also open up the flanks, so you can place units on your enemy's flanks, and this is kind of a double-edged sword because obviously they're behind enemy lines and they can be attacked very easily, and the first round you deploy them, they actually take about 5-10 to 10 seconds to become active and can be attacked during that time, so it's very much a, a trade-off there. And the reason you may want to put things on the enemy flank is because units tend to attack the first thing they can reach and the first thing they can see. So if you can create a distraction in the enemy's backline, then you can maybe crush them on the front because they have fewer units coming to the front line. So perhaps you're starting to get an appreciation of how complicated and how many decisions are involved in playing one of these games. You've got the perk choice every single round, and that tends to be a short-term versus long-term benefit scenario. Do you choose three units to help you right now? Or do you perhaps choose passive perks which will increase your credit income into the future? And of course you can also choose perks which give you battleground abilities. So every third or fourth turn you can summon a devastating nuclear missile or something. Now these are obviously dramatic and game-breakingly strong, but there's a downside and they can't be used very frequently. Most of these decisions boil down to some sort of a trade-off. You're deciding whether you want to increase the size of your army or perhaps you want to upgrade your existing units and make them much more durable and powerful. You're also thinking, do you want a strong front line, or do you want to introduce the ability to flank your opponents and start to spread out their army more thinly? The decision-making process actually begins before you even enter the battle. In the Unit Loadout tab, you can choose up to four skills for each unit, which they will then carry into the battles. And of course, there's a trade-off here as well, because each of these has about six to eight different skills to choose from, so you can only take a few of them with you. So it's very much up to the player to decide which ones suit their playstyle and which ones perhaps synergize well with other units. And of course in this tab you can also choose cosmetic skins for your different types of units. Over the life of its early access period, the game had numerous important patches and has enjoyed many quality of life additions, some of which are very smart and innovative. StarCraft fans will recognize some of these features as things that we had to fight tooth and nail for for many years to even get anything close to this, as Blizzard would repeatedly say, the technology just doesn't exist to implement this feature. One thing that jumps out fairly quickly within the game client is the idea of automated weekly tournaments. This is a feature that we enjoyed in Warcraft, and sadly lost for a long time in Starcraft. 
it really does create a sense of the game being alive and connected. In addition to being able to watch the tournament unfold live as a spectator, you can also come back later to see the results summarised and click into any match which interests you to watch the replay. Particularly interesting rounds from these tournament matches will also make their way into the community challenges, so you can put yourself in the perspective of your favourite player and see if you can do a better job winning a particular round on their behalf. The reason we can do all this cool stuff involving spectating and replays is because the outcome of each round of battle is entirely deterministic. As many times as you run it, the outcome will be the same. And this is because there's no RNG in this game. There's no 10% chance to score a critical hit. Everything is just flat. Within the replay client, you can move freely between each preparation and combat round. And at any given moment, you can jump in and take control of a player's perspective and continue playing the game from that point on. As somebody who has a lot of baggage from StarCraft 2 and thinking about the ridiculous excuses why we couldn't do things like this in StarCraft, this is all very exciting and cool to me. Perhaps it's less, it's less exciting to those that don't know the battles we had with StarCraft, but trust me, this is, this is interesting stuff. Within the Spectator client, there is a game resource called Insight, and essentially it's something that you can spend. So you can stake your insight on betting who will win a particular match, and you can browse matches and see which ones have the most insight riding on them. Again, this is just another feature which I think creates a sense of the game being alive and brings people together and creates more interest in the weekly tournaments, for example. And there's even an insight leaderboard, so people are quite competitive when it comes to this. Another relatively simple, but actually really impactful feature is being able to control the game speed. About 15 seconds into a combat round, players are given the option to vote to speed up the round. And if both agree, then the rest of the battle will take place at high speed. This feature also automatically kicks in if there's some sort of stalemate. So for example, if you have flying units against ground units which can't shoot up, then it will just zoom through to the end of the battle. I'm also very fond of the visual indicators, which aid you in positioning your units. They also show you the attack range of your units and an estimation of which enemy target they will try to attack first. When you consider that most units have at least one and sometimes two permanent range upgrades amongst their potential trainable skills in the unit loadout, and you can give your army a temporary one round range boost, it really is important to have these range indicators. The attack target preview also really introduces another sort of tactical element to the game because it becomes a game of cat and mouse where as ranges increase and room becomes scarce, you start placing units near the front, potentially squishy units which have high firepower and you don't want them in a position where as soon as the round begins they get sniped by some sort of ranged attack. So it becomes a case of placing units in tantalizingly close positions but then for the next round maybe you place a bunch of small cheap units in front of them called chaff and obviously those will then take precedence as the target. So it's very much a game of kind of like dangling bait in front of people, you know, put an expensive unit near the front and they think they can snipe it, but then you put something in front of that and then their snipers are vulnerable to the, the spam of small units. So it's a real kind of back and forth tug of war kind of thing. It's interesting. <laughs> There's a lot that's good about this game, and it's particularly impressive when you factor in its low price point of around $15. A metric people tend to look to with these sorts of games is how many different types of units can you build. In this regard, Mechabellum stacks up well, sporting over 20, but crucially, these are visually compelling to look at, and they boast interesting and unique mechanics as well. I find the attack animations very satisfying to look at, particularly when coupled with the audio, which I think is pretty much spot on. Lightweight attacks very much sound lightweight, whereas the powerful Doomsday weapons, they really have a weighty, satisfying crunch to them. Now, I spoke before about the idea of mobile auto battlers and how they can be simplistic and bogged down with microtransactions. Well, Mechabellum is the extreme opposite of this. It is incredibly detailed and ambitious in scale, and that's one of its strengths. It's been a very long time since I've been this hooked on a game. I've constantly wanted to go back in and try new loadouts, try new strategies, different upgrades, different perks, and the permutations almost feel limitless without sort of being daunting and overwhelming. It just constantly feels like a chance to experiment and innovate. It really is very compelling and a really <laughs> Somewhat addictive game to play. I've sunk an embarrassing amount of hours into this already. 
other than perhaps Baldur's Gate 3. I can't think of a game where the early access phase has been so productive. The amount of good features and additions to the game which have happened during this is just remarkable, and the finished product really hits you in the face in terms of its quality. Everything is very polished, more so than many AAA games which release in a half-finished state and require gigantic day one patches. This feels like a really tight product. I think a lot of the features that they've added around the community are really positive additions, so the idea of replays and spectating and weekly automated tournaments and everything that just sort of ties the thing together it makes it feel like a living, breathing experience as opposed to a lonely game browsing client. Now if the early access is anything to go by and the regular cadence of patches, I think we can expect the game to be well maintained going forward. And even at the time of making this video, we're into version 1.1 and we're talking about new types of secret units and everything, so I think to keep these games fresh you do need to have sort of seasonal updates and changing the balance and everything else, and it looks like they're well positioned to do that. Now there are obviously some downsides, but I would just caveat this by saying your mileage may vary. Some of these issues may be ones that I experienced because of my own computer setup or things like that. Now coming from the world of Desert Strike, where you would have three versus three battles and many hundreds if not thousands of units on the screen, I was a bit disappointed to see that the maximum was four players. And when you load in the four player brawl, so that's a free for all battle, you even receive a warning telling you that this may have significant slowdown and they're working to improve the optimization. So yeah, that is definitely a criticism that as soon as unit counts get quite large, the game does start to sort of grind to a halt and be a bit sluggish. Now, my computer is definitely not the best, but it does seem to be a generalised issue and they could definitely improve things. Another small issue that I felt was that I found the, the unit placement to be a bit, a bit cumbersome, so the idea of having to double click on each individual unit to then try and move it. Sometimes it went wrong and I would triple click or only click once and things wouldn't work the way I wanted them to. And when you add new units, or your opponent adds new units from one round to the next, I found that it was very difficult to actually click on these new units. So sometimes my opponent would add like a, a big new powerful unit, like a melting point, and I could not click on it the next round, so I couldn't see what its skill loadout was. So things like that were a little bit of a, a small issue, but certainly not ruining the experience. And this game is very much a multiplayer, player versus player experience. And they have made some effort to create tutorials and solo content such as practice modes, but essentially, sooner or later, you'll find yourself going up against other players. I was looking at some of the negative Steam reviews for this game, and I think some of it boils down to the fact that this game was in early access for 16 months. The gameplay mechanics haven't changed too much in that time, and obviously people that were testing the game in early access became very good at it. They really understood at a deep level, the way to, to have good formations, to have good compositions. And when the game launched, it marked the beginning of a new season. And essentially there was an influx of these brand new players who were entering the matchmaking against a bunch of veterans who essentially had up to 16 months of experience, but were marked as zero MMR. And a lot of new players essentially got absolutely clapped by these veterans. And it was a bit off-putting. I joined the party slightly late, maybe 10 days after launch, and I kind of didn't experience these issues. I did 10 matchmaking games, and then ever since then, I've been winning half of my matches, and my MMR has been adjusting accordingly. So I found it to be absolutely fine, and I think, given the size of the player base, I think the issue has kind of self-corrected fairly quickly. So any players who started on day one and had a bad experience, I would suggest they try again. Now any online multiplayer experience is only as positive as its community and I've definitely had a few issues in this regard. Now there is an underlying structural issue which is exacerbating things. You have all these experienced early access players who are very good and then you have all these green new players who are joining upon release and there needs to be more patience towards people being bad basically. There's a real reluctance to join any team games because there's a fear that you'll be the player in the 2v2 squad that drags down the team and gets flamed for being bad. This issue is definitely not unique to Mechabellum, in fact it's widespread across all multiplayer games, and the only thing I think they can really do is perhaps create more single player content, so more tutorials, more practice modes, 
just anything to give players a bit more sort of confidence before they have to jump into PvP. The other thing that developers could do is, I mean they are quite communicative with the player base, but they could really try to push that agenda and tell, tell the early access crew that they need to stop being elitist and they need to be inclusive because they probably, they like the game, they've bought it, they've supported it. If they want it to be a success, they need to welcome new players. So I mean, a lot of that is a problem which many developers have tried and failed to really properly address and it's just kind of, it's just a systematic issue with multiplayer gaming. But certainly on the optimization side, I do think they can improve things and I would like to see at least six players in the future. So where would I score this game on a scale of 1 to 10? Pretty damn high, I think. When you think about the game's price and then you weigh that against the hours of enjoyment it can provide, then it really does stack up very favourably in a value for money sense. It's up there with games such as Stardew Valley or these other kind of smash it indie games which are cheap but massively replayable. I would rate this game a 9 out of 10 and I would definitely cite it as one of the games of the year and it's certainly probably the game that I've played the most so far this year. I think the game is very high quality, very polished and it's full of really smart quality of life features which have obviously been developed during an extremely productive early access phase. Thanks to the wide selection of generally interesting different units, all the different loadouts, the perks, the items, the upgrades, the tactical replayability is just off the scale and it really is a compelling experience. You might think, oh, you can't micro the units, oh, there's no real economy, what, what, what do I do? This will be boring, but trust me, there's a lot of depth to this. So if the idea of massive mechanized armies, giant death robots and doomsday weapons appeals to you, then I really think you'll be interested in a game called Beyond All Reason. Clicking on the link below will take you to a video where I've done a preview of the game, running through its key features and explaining why I've had so much fun playing it. BAR is actually part of a subgenre of RTS titles, characterized by massive army sizes, real modeling of projectiles, terraforming, and the idea of zooming the map in and out so you can see the entire battlefield from an aerial view or focus on the smallest of skirmishes. If that sounds interesting to you, then click on the video below to learn a bit more about the history of the genre and what the future looks like.